I wanted to uh, assure that I would get a strong introduction, so I arranged to be, uh, be Justice Souter's driver tonight. Uh, needless to say, David, you have a ride home. Uh, I want to assure you my remarks will be briefer than the introduction. Uh, I do, though, want to begin by uh, remembering the person for whom this award is named. I did not have a chance to argue in front of Chief Justice Kennison, but uh, my judicial elders have kept me informed about him. Uh, I also remember reading his tort and property cases as a first year law student. His reputation preceded my first uh, visit to New Hampshire. Uh, he was a great common law judge. He was a judicial modernizer. Uh, and he was a national leader in judicial education as well. So it's uh, an extraordinary honor to uh, receive this award. Uh, I wanted to use the time allotted to me to, uh, to do three brief things. I want to uh, remember a, a sponsor. I want to uh, acknowledge a couple of influences, uh, and I want to thank a few people. Uh, so uh, first, the sponsor. Uh, my life uh, took a dramatic turn, my working life, in 1984. I was a uh, homicide prosecutor in the Attorney General's office when uh, Tom Rath, the person who hired me when he was Attorney General, introduced me to uh, Senator Warren Rudman. Uh, Senator Rudman was looking for a young attorney to work on his staff and I jumped at the chance and I spent uh, two years working for him uh, on the Ethics Committee staff, working with the Ethics Committee staff when he chaired that committee, but also uh, doing the investigation of the money laundering at the Bank of Boston. If you've been around long enough, you might remember the Angelo crime family. And that investigation led to the currency transaction reporting laws. It was one of uh, Warren's first big events. Um, I uh, had a chance to work with him on the impeachment of uh, Judge Harry Claiborne, uh, which was one of the first um, modern uh, impeachment uh, judicial impeachment trials when he was a, a member of that special committee put together to hear the trial. Uh, and um, I spent two terrific years with him there, and then he brought me back for a third year to work on the staff of the Iran-Contra Committee. Uh, I returned to private practice in uh, New Hampshire with my partners, uh, several of whom are here tonight, uh, Tom and Sherry Young and Mike Pignatelli. And uh, five years after I left Warren, I got a call out of the blue uh, asking me if I would be interested uh, in serving as a district judge. Uh, that was, uh, I believe, in the early to mid-summer uh, of 1992. Uh, and uh, when I, of course, said yes, uh, Warren went to work. And he went to work for me, and he went to work for Steve McAuliffe, and he was able to secure our nominations and our confirmation in a matter of a few months in an election year. Uh, we were confirmed, Steve and I, in the last minutes of the session before they adjourned for the year uh, for the presidential election. Uh, and that's, that isn't a testament to Steve's qualifications or mine. <laughs> it's a testament to the esteem with which uh, Senator Rudman was held by his colleagues and by uh, President Bush. Uh, <clears throat> I learned a tremendous amount from Warren Rudman. I learned a lot about politics, but I also learned a lot about lawyering working for him. Uh, I'll always be grateful for having had the chance to work for him and uh, for the trust uh, and confidence he, he showed in me. Uh, <clears throat> I bet most of the people in this room remember their first meeting with uh, Justice Souter. Uh, I certainly remember mine. We did not coordinate our remarks, I can assure you, uh, but I wanted to mention that, that meeting because uh, I won't go into details about it, and it is true, I listened more than talked, which is a good piece of advice for young lawyers, but uh, I, uh, 
that meeting played a significant role uh, in my decision to come back uh, to New Hampshire. And over the years, I tried cases in front of Justice Souter. Uh, I argued appeals in front of Justice Souter. Uh, and I did some hiking in the White Mountains in between cases with Bill Glahn, Justice Souter, uh, and uh, got to know him reasonably well. And when I became a judge in 1992, um, we would meet for lunch when he was in town. Uh, and over the course of many long and interesting lunches, uh, we would talk about many things. We'd talk about New Hampshire history, New Hampshire politics, our friends, hiking. But we talked a lot about uh, judging. And we talked a lot about some justices that you well know, uh, people like Holmes and Cardozo and Harlan and Hand. Uh, and those lunches and the years of reading that followed from those lunches really played a major role uh, in um, my thinking about what it means to be a judge. Uh, so it's, it is nice to hear from the teacher that the student is doing okay. So that's a nice thing, Justice Souter. Thank you for, um, thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, of course, uh, Justice Holmes was right in celebrating experience over logic in the life of the law, and there's no theory of judging that can survive unscathed in the face of experience. And the best place to get experience is on the trial court bench, and I've been very fortunate to spend my career on the trial court bench. But I, uh, I have a secret weapon, a kind of experience multiplier that gives me an advantage over most judges, and that's the people that I work with. Uh, I, think, I think many of you know that almost every day for the last 24 years, we stop for the middle of the day and have lunch together. Anybody who uh, doesn't have other commitments shows up at lunch. And this was true when Jim Muirhead was with us, uh, and it continue, and it's true when Norm Stahl was with us, and it continues today. And we do talk about many things at lunch, and we have a lot of fun. But we talk a lot about judging. Uh, we talk a lot about the practical problems that uh, judges face. Uh, how do you deal with a potential conflict? Uh, what's the best way to conduct voir dire? How do you deal with a difficult lawyer? And there are a few of you out there occasionally present a challenge. Um, an issue that's before the Supreme Court this term, I struggled with several years ago. What do you do after a verdict when a juror comes forward and claims that other jurors were exhibiting racial bias during the uh, deliberations? Uh, these are really interesting and challenging issues. And we talk about them every day. We work through them as we have for 20 years. 20 plus years, and I, I feel it is my uh, secret weapon. Uh, it's helped me become a better judge. Uh, it's made the work so much more interesting and rewarding, and so uh, I want to acknowledge the influence that my colleagues have had over me. Uh, one of the principal benefits about being a, uh, a federal judge is you get to hire some of the best law school graduates in the country to serve as your law clerks. I've had over 40 of them come to work for me now, and they're everywhere. I've got former clerks at my law firm, uh, former clerks at uh, New Hampshire Legal Services, former clerks at uh, Sheehan, at the uh, University of New Hampshire General Counsel's Office. I have clerks who are uh, public defenders, and assistant U.S. attorneys, and ACLU lawyers, uh, and in big firms all around the country. Um, law clerks do a lot of the legal research. They dive deep into the record. They serve as a sounding board for judges. They bring their own creative thinking. And most, most of all, they bring a tremendous energy and enthusiasm for the law that's refreshing, rejuvenating. Um, and I don't know how I could have done the job without them, so I really want to uh, recognize several of them are here tonight, and two of them are uh, former Kirby Award winners, uh, and uh, it, it speaks to the quality of the people I've been able to hire over the years, and I've been very grateful to them. 
Uh, I want to acknowledge the best clerk's office in the United States, without question. Um, and I'm not, I'm not kidding about that. Judges who come to visit and lawyers from out of town are almost unanimous in their praise of our clerk's office. Uh, my courtroom deputies, my 25 year long assistant, Joan Osman, uh, they make the judges look good. They do it every day. They put uh, the interests of the public ahead of any other interests. Uh, they're organized, they're careful, uh, they're wonderful to work with, uh, and uh, we're very fortunate to uh, have them uh, to work with us on our court. And you're fortunate to have them as people that you can work with. Um, the last thing I want to do is to thank you. Those of you who come into my courtroom and bring your best work every day, you, you cannot appreciate how dependent we are on you. Um, until you're a judge, you cannot even really begin to fully appreciate it. You decide which cases to bring. You decide which witnesses to call, which arguments to press. We're lost without you. And without you, the rule of law would be a meaningless concept. Uh, I recognize that. And for those of you that bring your best work into my courtroom, thank you. I, I need it. I appreciate it. I, I very much value it. Uh, I know how fortunate I am to have had a chance to do this work. Uh, and I greatly appreciate the people that have helped me do it. Uh, and I, I know what an honor it is uh, to be associated in this small way with a great jurist like Chief Justice Kennison. So thank you to the Barr Foundation for giving me this award.